Good evening. So good to see you. Welcome to Bible study tonight. Are you out there? If you're out there, say hello. Yeah, you're out there. You're doing fine. And uh, it's the last day of May. It's the last day of May. June 1st, tomorrow. Unbelievable. Malcolm asked me if I started my Christmas shopping. No, but I started my Christmas list. That's a little selfish, but that's the way it goes. How, how fast time is moving on. We got a wonderful night tonight. I'm excited to tell you about it. But first, we have our prayer requests and our praises. I hope you have a sheet. If not, they're in the back, in the, uh, in the pew back there. And uh, make sure that uh, get one.
can just sit and relax a little bit at the beginning of our service and just be a family. And hear the heart of our family. I, I would say that one of the great blessings of not only our church, but of a true Bible church is that it's a family. And, oh man, I've learned a lot over families and you don't always agree. Sometimes you have disagreements and problems and difficulties and so on and so forth, but we, you love one another. And I do want love to be the theme of our church unless we love the brethren. And I thank you for working that out at, at our church. So on Wednesday night, we get to just kind of relax and share our praises. And I give you great praise tonight. And you have been praised and glorified tonight. Uh, your good hand, your omniscience and your infinite wisdom, your omnipotence in the fact that you can do the impossible is what Tammy said. And God, just the praise for the moments that we don't even know about, but you're so faithful. And then the, the prayer requests and the petitions. Some were not able to be verbalized. They called them unspoken. You know them. I pray you would meet them according to thy will. And I, I don't have any idea per se. Some I know what they're talking about, but not everyone. God, just work in that need. And then, of course, those that will be traveling. We ask for traveling mercies, and we've learned from the life of Carol out of Petro that just coming home from Sam's Club, you need God's protection. Because life can change on a dime. It can change in a moment. And we need your marvelous hand of guidance and protection. So I beg you to give traveling mercies to those. Lord, some need to be touched in their health. Many of these that need touched in their health also need touched in their soul. And so I pray, God, that you would touch them in their soul some in the area of cancer, some in the area of bladder, some in the area of eyes. Lord, it just seems like the physical needs are there, but praise the Lord, you're the great physician. and You can touch those in a wonderful and deep way. Lord, there's others that, that are praying for prodigals. And what a great prayer. I, I think when you pray for prodigals, you're, you're on Bible ground, man. That's the book of Luke. And the father knew what it was to have a prodigal and and we learn so much from that. So I, I, I lift those that have heavy hearts tonight for their family, for their for spiritual life and their family members, especially their children. And God, you would just minister grace to them and cover them and lead them and guide them. And Lord, I, I, I want to thank you for wisdom, wisdom that is found in you and wisdom that is bestowed upon the word of God as it is truth and wisdom that we glean and we need wisdom. I think of wisdom, I think about our building program. I pray, God, you continue to give us wisdom and provision and protection. And you're so faithful, Lord, and so much going on out there. I think, my, my goodness, if you don't watch over it, we're, where would it be? But we trust you with it. Lord, we're looking forward to tonight's service, looking forward to hear from Brother Will. God, you've got a, good call, a great calling upon his life. And I'm excited for the people to hear the opportunity he has this summer and to hear how he's grown in the word of God. Bless us now as we stand and sing. In Jesus' name, amen. Page number 549. Stand if you would. Let's sing, then we'll shake hands on higher ground. I'm pressing on the upward way. New high times leaning every day. Still praying as I'm onward bound. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand. My faith on heaven's stable land. A higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. My heart has no desire to stay. Where doubts arise and fears dismay. Some may dwell where these abound. My prayer, my aim is higher ground. Lord, lift me up and let me stand. 
by faith on heaven's stable land, a higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. I want to live above the world, though Satan's darts at me are hurled. For faith has caught the joyful sound, the song of saints on higher ground. Lord, let me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land, a higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. I want to skill the utmost height and catch a gleam of glory bright. But still I'll pray till have I found. Lord, lead me on to high. Sing it out now. Lord, lift me up and let me stand by faith on heaven's table land. A higher plane than I have found. Lord, plant my feet on higher ground. All right, turn around, shake hands. Welcome all those around you. All right, as you come back to your place, be seated if you would, please. We are, uh, you can be seated. What a delight it is tonight to introduce to you, once again, Brother Will Powell. Brother Will is the son of Jack and Millie Powell, and uh, Will has finished his second year at Pensacola Christian College with a major in pastoral ministries. And uh, he served last summer with us as an intern in his home church. An opportunity opened up for him this year in a place called Las Vegas. So I don't know how I feel about this. But uh, there's a great church out there called Liberty Baptist Church. And um, they, they needed some interns this summer. They have an intern program. He's going to tell you about it. He leaves on Friday. And so I said, Brother Will, before you leave, I want you to preach to us one time before you go. And so he's going to do our Bible study tonight, and I know you're going to be blessed. Would you please welcome Will Powell to Plantation Baptist Church? Well, thank you, Pastor Hunter, again for the opportunity that I have tonight just to uh, bring a message the Lord has laid on my heart. Uh, if you guys want to turn your Bibles a little early, we'll be in 2 Kings chapter 7, but I'll get there in just a moment. And uh, thank you for the introduction as well, Pastor Hunter. Just uh, that's something, sadly, that I'd probably mess up, just introducing myself, just because I don't want to write it down, but then I forget about myself. Uh, actually, when I uh, first got back on Mother's Day Sunday, I always love coming back to our home church. But then there's always the time when uh, people, I see new faces, and they don't recognize me. And uh, one gentleman came up and shook my sister's hand in my hand and said, hey, are you guys guests? I was like, no, actually, we're just back from college. And I should have told him, hey, in two and a half weeks, I'll actually be preaching. So you get to see me there. Uh, and as Pastor said, uh, this summer, um, beginning Friday, I'll fly out to Las Vegas, and I'll be there for 10 weeks. And they have a program where they actually call us their summer missionaries. 
And they take on around eight men, and uh, they allow us to serve in that church. And uh, this church was started by Dave Tice, where the Lord led him nearly 40 years ago. And he actually wrote a book talking about this called Hope for My Hometown, where he explained all the ways the Lord provided and all the ways the Lord worked in ways that he could have never imagined to begin this church and to plan it. And so now, nearly 40 years later, this church is still standing in Las Vegas, Sin City. Surprising, yes. And um, actually, I looked this up just the other day. There are actually more Catholic churches in Vegas than there are casinos, which actually might be worse, but... Uh, I want to uh, also give a bit of an overview of what we will be doing. Um, we begin the days at 8 o'clock, and we'll go to the church, and we'll have a time of personal devotions. And after that, they also give us another 45 minutes where we will spend time uh, being discipled by a pastor. Uh, after that, we spend about two and a half hours until noon where we'll be blitzing, just handing out invitations, uh, hanging them on doors, trying to reach as many houses as possible. After lunch from one to five, we'll spend four hours actually door knocking and knocking on doors and talking to people and sharing the gospel. And uh, their goal is for this summer for us to reach 100,000 homes in Las Vegas. And as well, we will also be doing visitation and going out and following up with some of the prospects from any visitors at the church or people that we contacted throughout the week. Also, as the missionaries, we will be running the Wednesday night explosion, which is their children's ministry. And we will run all the games, the activities, uh, the lessons, as well as some drama productions, which means I guess I'll have to learn how to act. (laughs) Also, they have something called Camp Liberty on Sundays from 8.15 till about noon, where it's a free day camp open in the community. Last summer, they had around 500 kids signed up and 60 came to know the Lord as their personal savior through that ministry. I'll also get to be a counselor at a one-week summer camp, as well as help out with other youth events. And a lot of people, when I tell them that I'm going to Las Vegas for the summer, they kind of give me this look, and they say, are you, are you serious? Are you going to work at a church in Sin City? And I'm like, yes. And so now I kind of understand how Dave Tice felt 40 years ago when he told people, you know what? I think the Lord is leading me to go back to my hometown and to start a Baptist church in Las Vegas. And I think that his... Uh, reasoning and his attitude behind it can be summed up in a couple of quotes. Uh, First, I wanted to quote John Keith Falconer, who said, I have but one candle of light to burn, and I would rather burn it out in a land filled with darkness than in a land flooded with light. Of course, Las Vegas, we know, is a very dark land. And uh, Brother Hank Hansen and I, a couple weeks ago, were joking, uh, talking about how South Florida is a very dark area as well. And uh, he joked that instead of sending missionaries out, We need to be bringing missionaries in. But after I thought about it, I realized we have enough missionaries here. And we can still send missionaries out as long as we are doing the work of missionary ourselves. It is our job here. This is our Jerusalem. And the Bible commands us that we should be reaching out. Uh, C.T. Studd said, Some wish to live within the sound of a chapel bell. I wish to run a rescue mission within a yard of hell. Uh, He was another missionary, I believe, and also uh, Isabel Kuhn was a missionary to China and Thailand. And he said, I believe that in each generation, God has called enough men and women to evangelize all the yet unreached tribes of the earth. It is not God who does not call. It is man who will not respond. And of course, if it is God's will for us, for all men to be saved, then also God has a plan for that. And I truly agree that in each generation of Christians, there have been enough of us called to reach every unreached tribe and people and nation. It's just sad that there are too many people who are not responding to the call of God on their lives. And that's just some quotes, like I said, that I feel like they've definitely been encouragement to me and uh, that we should be looking to reaching people who haven't even heard the gospel yet and to going to areas that have not been reached with the gospel and don't have the light of the gospel. But now we'll jump into 2 Kings chapter 7. I'll read from verse 1 down through verse 7. And the Bible says, Then Elisha said, Hear ye the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, Tomorrow about this time shall a measure of fine flour be sold for a shekel, and two measures of barley for a shekel in the gate of Samaria. Then a Lord, on whose hand the king leaned, answered the man of God, and said, Behold, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, Might this thing be? 
And he said, behold, thou shalt see it with thine eyes, but shalt not eat thereof. And there were four leprous men at the entering in of the gate. And they said one to another, why sit we here until we die? If we say we will enter into the city, then the famine is in the city and we shall die there. And if we sit still here, we die also. Now therefore come and let us fall unto the host of the Syrians. If they save us alive, we shall live. And if they kill us, we shall but die. And they rose up in the twilight to go unto the camp of the Syrians. And when they were come to the uttermost part of the camp of Syria, behold, there was no man there. For the Lord had made the host of the Syrians to hear a noise of chariots and a noise of horses, even the noise of a great host. And they said one to another, Lo, the king of Israel hath hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to come upon us. Wherefore they rose and fled in the twilight and left their tents and their horses and their asses, even the camp as it was, and fled for their life. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for the opportunity that I have to uh, just share a message you've laid on my heart, God, that you've uh, used in my life and convicted me over this, God. I pray that you would use me, Lord. I pray that you would cleanse me of any sin, Lord, that you would empty me of myself and fill me with your spirit. Uh, allow it that it wouldn't be my words, Lord, but your words. And I also pray for the hearts of everyone in here that they would be open to receive the message that you have for each one of us, God, and to use it in our lives. And help us to come out of this service different, Lord, and changed and with a new fire to uh, reach others for you, Lord. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. So first, and actually I'm sorry I forgot to give you a bit of a background. What is going on here is that the Syrians have besieged the city of Samaria so that there is a famine in the land. So that's why in the first verse, uh, Elisha comes forward and gives what the, God had said. God had told him that the famine would be over. So I wanted to begin, first of all, we will look at the reality of the desperation. First we see, if we turn back to chapter 6, verse 25, we see the foolish prices. Verse 25 says, And there was a great famine in Samaria, and behold, they besieged it, until an ass's head was sold for fourscore pieces of silver, and the fourth part of a cab of dove's dung for five pieces of silver. So, Verse, or chapter 7, verse 1, Elisha says that the Lord told him that tomorrow, 24 hours from that time, that a measure of fine flour would be sold for a shekel and two measures of barley for a shekel. But back here in the midst of the famine, it says that an ass's head was sold for 80 pieces of silver and the fourth part of a cab of dove's dung for five pieces of silver. This doesn't even sound like food and yet it's being sold at outrageous prices that I'm sure the people could not afford. The people here were starving. They had no hope. They had nothing. And next, down we see uh, the fighting woman. Beginning in verse 26, there's a woman that comes to the king. And she, she asks the king for help. And the king says, what aileth thee? And down in verse uh, 28 says, and she answered, this woman said unto me, give thy son that we may eat him today and we will eat my son tomorrow. So we boiled my son and did eat him. And I said unto her on the next day, Give thy son, that we may eat him. And she hath hid her son. So here we see two women. One comes to the king, and she's like, Well, we made an agreement. We said we would eat my son today, and tomorrow eat her son. So we ate my son, and the next day I come to her, and she's hid her son. King, what do we do? And his response is in verse 30. We can see that he is heartbroken because he rent his clothes and he put on sackcloth. He could not believe his people were going through this. I mean, how does a king react to what is going on in his city? I mean, when a woman comes to him and says, hey, we were planning on eating this woman's son after we ate mine, and she hasn't done it. So go tell her that we need to eat her son. The king's obviously not going to respond by saying, yes, of course, you know what, I'm hungry too. I'll take a bite. No, no, of course not. He's heartbroken. He cannot believe his people have stooped so low that they would eat their own children just to satisfy their hunger. And then back in chapter 7, verses 3 through 4, we see the fearful lepers. And there were four leprous men at the entering in at the gate, and they said one to another, Why sit we here until we die? If we say we will enter into the city, then the famine is in the city, and we shall die there. And if we sit still here, we die also. 
Now therefore come and let us fall unto the host of the Syrians. If they save us alive, we shall live. And if they kill us, we shall but die. See, these lepers, they realized they had no other hope. They were hopeless and they were helpless and they were hungry. And it got to the point that they realized they could not go in the city because there was no food. They could not stay outside of the city because they would just die there also. Their only hope was actually to go to the enemies of Israel, of Samaria, and to just see if the Syrians would save them alive or if the Syrians would kill them. That was all that they had. So here we've just looked at the reality of the desperation of the city of Samaria. But next is the realization of deliverance. Beginning in verse 1, we see the direct promise of God. It says, Then Elisha said, Hear ye the word of the Lord. Thus saith the Lord, Tomorrow about this time shall a measure of fine flour be sold for a shekel and two measures of barley for a shekel in the gate of Samaria. I'm sure just the fact that food would, being, would be being sold, actual food, was surprising enough, let alone for it to be at a reasonable price where the people could actually afford it. And he said that this is something that God had specifically told him, that God had said. Yet, right after that, we see that there was a Lord in disbelief that provoked God. In verse 2, it says, Then a Lord on whose hand the king leaned answered the man of God and said, Behold, if the Lord would make windows in heaven, might this thing be? And he said, Behold, thou shalt see it with thine eyes, but shalt not eat thereof. So basically he says, Hey, if God is even able to do this, do you think he's actually going to do this for us? And Elisha responds in faith and says, Of course he will. And you're going to see it too, but you're not going to eat of the food. And we see at the end of the chapter, in verses 16 and 17, that that basically happens. After the famine is ended, the food is being sold for the exact prices that had been predicted. And the king asked that very same Lord to go and to stand before the gate, to keep the gate. But as the people hear about it, they run out the gate and they trample him and he dies. So he did get to hear about how the famine was ended, just that God had predicted and God had told them. And he didn't get to eat thereof because of his doubt. And finally, we see the definite provision of God. Beginning in verse 5, we read, And they rose up in the twilight to go unto the camp of the Syrians. And when they were come to the uttermost part of the camp of Syria, behold, there was no man there. For the Lord had made the host of the Syrians to hear a noise of chariots and a noise of horses, even the noise of a great host. And they said one to another, Lo, the king of Israel hath hired against us the kings of the Hittites and the kings of the Egyptians to come upon us. Wherefore they arose and fled in the twilight and left their tents and their horses and their asses, even the camp as it was, and fled for their life. And when these lepers came to the uttermost part of the camp, they went into one tent and did eat and drink and carried that silver and gold and raiment and went and hid it and came again and entered into another tent and carried thence also and went and hid it. So we see that clearly. It was a direct provision of God. He drove out the camp. I mean, this city had, or this army had just taken over Samaria and besieged it. I'm sure they were strong. I'm sure that they had a protocol to go uh, and to follow if somebody had attacked them. But that all went out the window because they were so scared for their lives when they heard the noise that God had made that they didn't even check to look and see who was coming. They just turned around and ran and left everything exactly as it was. And that's exactly, that was exactly God's plan to use these leprous men to provide for the city of Samaria. But we see before that these men decide to use this for their city. We see that they're taking off their probably tattered rags they had as clothes and putting on new robes. They're eating and filling their stomachs with the food that had probably been empty for a long time. And they're taking silver and gold so much that they can't even hold on to it themselves, but they're going out and they're burying it and leaving it out there and going back and getting more and going back and burying it away to save for themselves. You see, they definitely had great news for the city of Samaria, but they weren't sharing it. And sometimes we have great news that we don't always share the way we should. 2 Corinthians 4.3 says, But if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. So if we have the gospel, but we're hiding it in ourselves, and we're not sharing it the way we should, all we're doing is hiding it from the people who need it the most. And that was where these leprous men were. They had this great news, the news of God's provision, 
but they were hiding it for themselves. But then, finally, we see the reasonable service of the dead. And I use that uh, wording to tie in Romans 12, 1, which says, I beseech ye therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Now, these men didn't have this verse, but they realized that it was their reasonable service to share this news. In verse 9, we read, Then they said one to another, We do not well. This day is a day of good tidings, and we hold our peace. If we tarry till the morning light, some mischief will come upon us. Now therefore come, that we may go and tell the king's household. They realized that it was basically their duty to go back and to tell everyone about how God had provided to end the famine in the city. And they began it with this statement, We do not well. They realized what they were doing was not right and was not what God would have them to do. See, these men were dead before they came into the camp of the Syrians. They had no hope. They could not help themselves, but they were hungry and they were looking for an answer. Just like us, before we came to Christ, we had no hope and we were helpless. There's nothing that we could have done to make up the gap to get us to heaven. And just like these leprous men, we came across a victory that God has given us that we did nothing to deserve, that we did nothing to earn. All we had to do was accept Christ. All they had to do was to search and to walk into the camp. God had already driven out the enemy. God had already defeated the enemy for them. The same way for us, God has already defeated death and sin by sending his son Jesus Christ to die on the cross. We already have the victory. And these men, they felt like they owed a debt to their people. And Paul said it, but we also should owe a debt to all men for the gospel's sake. Because of the good news that we have, we have to tell others. Charles Spurgeon said, Someone asked, will the heathen who have never heard the gospel be saved? It is more a question with me whether we, who have the gospel and fail to give it to those who have not, can be saved. Now, I'm not saying that if you don't share the gospel that you're not saved, but that is definitely an identifying mark of the believer. One who cannot hold their peace about what they have in Christ. And that was these men. They said, this day is a day of good tidings, and we hold our peace. They realized that that's not something that they should do. They couldn't even hold in that good news. Just the same way that we should be. We should be unable to hold in the gospel and to stop telling others about it and talking about it. In Acts 20, verses 26 and 27, Paul said, Wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare unto you all the counsel of God. So Paul was basically saying that there is no one that one day when they come before the Lord would be able to blame Paul that they rejected Christ because Paul had not shared the gospel. He said the reason I am pure of the blood of all men was because I have told them all the gospel. I have done all that I can. Every person I've come across, I've shared the gospel with them. And I feel like that's not exactly the mentality many Christians have today. I have heard something taught, which can be referred to as lifestyle evangelism. Some people have the mentality that if I just live a good enough life and people see the light in me, that they'll come to me and that they'll ask me what makes me different. And then, and then I can tell them about Jesus Christ. But other than that, I'll just live a good life and continue to live and do what the Bible tells me to do. But actually here, just like in Acts 20, we see Paul saying that the reason why he felt he was pure of the blood of all men was not because he lived a good enough life and people saw the light shining through him and they asked him about Jesus Christ. It was because he went out and he told others. And my friend Cody Harned wrote an article and in it, and I quote, Instead of lifestyle evangelism, let's make evangelism a lifestyle. Instead of focusing on living a good enough life for others to ask us, we should be doing that, yes. But also, one way to make our light shine much brighter is to actually go out and to tell others and to make it a priority to actually tell other people about Christ, to invite people to church, not just to wait for them to ask us. And also, just like these leprous men, We should be unable to hold our peace. 
They said, if we tarry till the morning light, some mischief will come upon us. Now therefore come that we may go and tell the king's household. These men couldn't even wait a single moment. They realized that if we wait till tomorrow, what if something happens to us? What if we're not able to get back to everyone and tell them this good news? Or what if something happens to them? People were probably dying every day at this time. And just like today, we live in a dark world. There is a famine out there for the word of God. And people are dying every day. Some not even having heard the gospel. And we need to not even wait a single moment to tell others. See, these men, they didn't have a command to go out and tell others. They just felt that it was necessary. But we, we have the great commission from our Lord Jesus Christ. When he said, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. We are told to go out and to tell others. Yet, I see it true in my own life too. We don't always do what we should be doing. Hudson Taylor said, The Great Commission is not an option to be considered. It is a command to be obeyed. William Carey said, Is not the commission of our Lord still binding upon us? Can we not do more than now we are doing? And I would say, yes, of course. There is so much more that we can be doing. Each one of us, every single day, in our own personal lives, can be reaching more people for Christ. David Livingstone said, If a commission by an earthly king is considered an honor, how can a commission by a heavenly king be considered a sacrifice? See, so many people sometimes may talk about the things that they've given up to serve the Lord. But when we talk about serving the Lord, we should not be speaking in terms of sacrificing anything. We should be talking about how much we have gained. Because when you serve the Lord, it is pure gain. You aren't losing anything. There is no one that will ever get to heaven and say, I gave too much to the Lord. I gave too much of my time, or I gave too much of my money. Or maybe I told too many people the gospel. That will never happen. Instead, so many of us one day will stand before the Lord and maybe even be ashamed that I did not do enough. I had many more opportunities to serve the Lord that I did not take up. There were so many people that I should have witnessed to that I did not witness to. I mean, I feel like I can't go out into public or go anywhere without feeling the Holy Spirit lead me to at least go and witness to somebody. Yet, there are so many opportunities that I have passed up in my own life. And that's something that I don't want to do. I want to be able to have the same testimony as Paul and say that I am pure of the blood of all men. For I have not shunned to declare unto them all the counsel of God. I don't want to be able to get to heaven and somebody say that I had the opportunity to share the gospel with them, but I didn't. And that's one reason why, just this past semester, I started carrying around gospel tracts on me all the time. One reason is it keeps my mindset on the fact that this is why I'm here. This piece of paper has the gospel on it. And if somebody doesn't want to have a conversation, I can leave that with them and they can read it. Or I can talk to someone. And it's sad that I never knew uh, that right outside, to the left, on the wall, there are gospel tracts in our church with the church address, the church number, and everything on it for us to take out and hand out. They're completely free. And they're free to everyone else too. Please don't charge for them. I mean, it may, might make it seem more valuable to others, but honestly, what is inside of those pieces of paper is invaluable. But it really doesn't take any time at all to hand out a track and just to say, hey, if you have a minute, you can read this. And there are also, also church invitations. I've been at the grocery store with my mom, and she just hands them the invitation and says, hey, I want to invite you to my church. And you know, they usually smile and say, thank you very much. And honestly, Usually when you go up to cashiers, they're not going to say no or reject you. It's kind of their job to be friendly and to be nice and inviting. So and they're going to accept it. And also when you go somewhere, you know, out to eat, leave it with a tip. Now, the other day, we were actually Saturday night at Japan Inn. And uh, I realized that we didn't have any tracks on us. So I was like, Mom, Mom, do you have a track in your purse? Please, we need to leave one. And she was like, all I have is this million dollar track you left me or you gave me when you got back from school. And she loved it because it looks like a million dollar bill and on the back it says the million dollar question. And it's an interesting track, but that's all we had, so we left it. But I don't know if I would recommend that as a tip. <laughs> <laughs> they might take that the wrong way or maybe be offended. But it is so simple just to hand out a piece of paper. You know, and sometimes 
I, I hope that I can get to the point where I don't need to wait for the Holy Spirit to tell me to go witness because you're already planning on it. And that should be all of our goals to not even wait for the Holy Spirit to tell you to go witness to that person because you're already on your way, already have the track in hand, already know what you're going to say. I have a friend that actually, he says the same thing just about every time he uh, shares a track. It takes no more than 30 seconds. He does it through, in the drive through He's done it in the toll booth on the way to the beach, everywhere he goes. And what he says is he hands this to them, the track, and he says, I used to be a drunk, but this changed my life. And it can change yours too. It'll only take a minute for you to read it. So go ahead and read it. Also, by the way, what's your name? And he'll ask for a prayer request. And after that, he'll tell him, you know, I'm going to pray for you this week and drive off. And that takes no more than 30 seconds. Yet it can change a person's eternity. Amen. And so why are we so afraid of doing that? I've been door to door. I've probably knocked on, you know, a couple hundred doors uh, my freshman year when I used to go door to door at school. And of all the times I've gone door to door, I've had the door slammed on me once. Only one time. Yet I feel like the mentality, and before I got into it, I was scared that every other door is probably just going to slam in my face and everybody's going to reject me. Honestly, that doesn't happen. There are so many people who have no idea what the gospel is even about. And it actually has saddened me that I thought many people might know it and have just rejected. But there are so many people who have no idea what the Bible even says about how to get to heaven. And they're so receptive sometimes. Just today, I went to the mall to change out a pair of pants for their correct size. And right when I went to leave, I left a lady with a, a track. And I have these tracks for my school that say, For God so loved, and then it has a picture of the earth. For God so loved the world. As I was walking away, she said, Is this for me? With excitement in her voice. And I turned around and said, Yes, that's for you. Go ahead and read it. And as I walked away, she said, Thank you so much. Have a great day. She was so excited. Just She was already opening it up and reading it. It was so easy. We should be trying our hardest to reach everyone with the gospel. Oswald J. Smith said, No one has the right to hear the gospel twice while there remains someone who has not heard it once. Now, I'm not saying it's wrong to share the gospel twice or multiple times with your family members that you care for and that you love. But we know that Paul had a huge heart for the Jewish people. In Romans 9.3 he basically said that he would trade his eternal salvation for the salvation of the Jewish people. But we see in Acts 18.6, he says, uh, and when they opposed themselves and blasphemed, Paul, he, being Paul, shook his raiment and said unto them, your blood be upon your own heads, I am clean. From henceforth I will go unto the Gentiles. And even though Paul had this huge heart for the Jewish people, he is known as apostle to the Gentiles. Because after they had heard he no longer had to keep on telling them the gospel and to try to convince them and force them to accept Christ. He realized it was much more important for him to reach the ones who had not even heard yet the gospel and how that they too can be saved. Oswald J. Smith also said, we talk of the second coming. Half the world has never heard of the first. And it's sad to think about that it is true. Yes, we do talk about his second coming and we look forward to that. Yet there are still so many people, even here in South Florida, that don't even know about his first coming. So what are we doing to reach others, to tell them about Jesus Christ? As I said, it's, it can be very simple. It can be as simple as handing out a piece of paper and asking somebody to read it in their spare time. But the change there can be immense. You can change someone's entire, entire eternal destiny through that. And really, it's our only reasonable service. It is our only duty. It only makes sense for us to be telling everyone. Because if we have this great news, why would we not tell them? I mean, if I had the cure for cancer, of course, I would tell everyone who has cancer how they can be cured. And we have much better news, much greater news, to save them from a much worse disease. Amen. So what are we doing to tell everyone what they can do so that they can go to heaven one day? Just handing out tracts, just making that an effort everywhere you go. Every time you come across someone, every time you have just a one-minute conversation with someone you don't even know, say, by the way, can I leave this for you to read? And, of course, pray for that. And the Lord can use that simple piece of paper for somebody's salvation. Let's pray. 
Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, again, I thank you so much for the opportunity that I had tonight just to uh, share a message on my heart, God, and to uh, just to just speak at my uh, home church one last time, Lord, before I go and spend a summer in Las Vegas. Lord, I, I thank you for uh, giving me this great opportunity to grow and to prepare for my future ministry. As I don't know where that is yet, Lord, I also pray for the people of this church, for the young people, God, as uh, many are going to college this next year and maybe trying to decide what you would have for them, God. I hope that they would be seeking to serve you, Lord, with their lives, as well as everyone, all of our children, God, as they grow in you and grow in this church. I pray that they would seek to serve you. Lord, I pray you'd also help us to not be like these leprous men as they first were at first, until they realized we do not well. Sometimes we get to the point where we can say, we do not well. Lord, help us not to get there. I pray that you would help it to be on the forefront of our mind always to be sharing the gospel with as many people as we come across. And as we do it, Lord, honestly, we would get better at it and grow more bold, but I pray that it would be through you and through your spirit and that you would strengthen us and give us boldness, God. Help us to know what to say when we get in situations. Lord, I pray that you would give us opportunities this week to share the gospel, to tell people about Christ, and to invite people to church, God, just be with us, Lord. Again, I thank you for this great opportunity that I had. I thank you for this loving church, Lord. Um, and I pray for them this summer that this ministry would continue to grow. Lord, I pray for the children's ministries, as well as the youth ministries, as well as pastors. He will be preaching every single week this summer, God. You continue to be with him, Lord. Uh, speak through him and use him to continue to do your will here in this church. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. He preached me under conviction two years ago in the summertime. Will and I sat in two chairs back here in the choir room. He sat there at that time with a scholarship to the University of Miami. What you don't know about him is he's brilliant and highly sought after academically in the University of Miami. He said, we want you and he was headed into the pre-law program. And he sat in that blue chair across from him and he said, Pastor, how did you know that God wanted you to be in ministry? And I said, why do you ask? He said, I got a scholarship. I've, got, I've always wanted to be a lawyer. And he said, um, I, I, just, I just don't have peace right now. I said, well, I knew that I, God wanted me to be in the ministry because he would not relent in my mind. I constantly thought about it. I constantly was putting messages together. I was constantly thinking about preaching. And I said, I just, I couldn't shake it. And he said, that's happening in my mind. He said, I think God is calling me to full-time ministry. And so he walked away from the University of Miami. He walked away from what he always wanted to be to what God wants him to be. Knowing that, and you can applaud that. So listen to what the young man does. He's not preaching to you anything he doesn't practice. He walks up to a house. He has no idea who lives there. He takes his fist. He knocks on the door. Whoever or whatever opens the door, and he says, I'd like to tell you about Jesus. He will do it from 9 o'clock till noon. He will eat lunch, and then from 1 to 5 every day, eight men to reach 100,000 homes. I'd like to tell you about Jesus. I'd like to tell you about Jesus. And, and not begrudgingly, he signed up to do it. I, I think if he can have that kind of boldness, we, we sure should be able to speak a word for the Lord. Do you have a track in your purse? Do you have a track in your car? Do you have a track in your pocket? When's the last time you said any, to anybody, I was lost 
and I was a mess in my life. But the Lord changed my life, and what he did for me, he can do for you and hand a track to him. We do not well that we do not share the gospel. By the way, when you empty that track tonight, there's a whole bunch more tracks back here. I'll tell you something that I do at a restaurant, and Willard taught me how to do this. When the waiter comes to me, now we stop and I'll say something like this. I'll say, sir or ma'am, we're Christians and we're getting ready to pray for our food. And I sure would love to pray for you if you have a need. You would be amazed. Never one time have we ever been dismissed, made fun of. I've seen, I've seen men and women stand there and weep and literally in the middle of their, with their apron on taking my order, weep telling me about their problems and then come back and say, I can't tell you what, what, what this means to me. When people know you love them and you speak with genuine care, they listen. They listen. It's powerful. <laughs> I'll wrap it up by, with two things. It would have been foolish for the city not to go out there and look at what those two lepers were talking about, wouldn't it? All of that food was right there available. And if they'd have said, ah, oh, they're out of their mind, we're not going out there to get that food, they'd have died in that city. If you're here tonight and you're not saved, it would be foolish for you to reject Jesus Christ because there is a life available to you. The same way those city folks would have been disturbed. I trust if you don't know the Lord that you'd see me or Brother Malcolm or somebody tonight. Let us take a Bible and show you how. I want you to do two things. I want you to promise me that you'll pray for Will as he goes. And then I did something tonight. He, he's going out there. It's not a paid thing. They're going to help him a little bit with his school bill, but they won't give him any money. There's an offering box right back there. He needs some quarters for the ministry out there. You didn't catch that joke, did you? <laughs> he probably could use a few bucks to put in his pocket. He promised me he wouldn't spend them on the slot machines. <laughs> but I thought maybe if you wanted to drop a few dollars in there tonight, I'd love to send him out with a little bit of money in his pocket to let him know his church is proud of him. And by the way, we're proud of all of our young people. Some, I, I, I wish you could hear the stories of our young people, know the witness they are, the boldness that they have. God is using the young people of our church. He just happens to be one of them. He's got a special calling upon his life. He did a great job tonight, a great job. Go out there and be faithful. Walk with the Lord. Love those people. And let God open doors for you. And um, I, I know you'll be blessed, and we'll be praying for you. All right, stand with me if you would, and we'll pray. I want to pray for him. And then we're going to sing page number 552, one verse to go out of, I am thine, O Lord. Heavenly Father, God, thank you for what we've heard tonight. Thank you for the man of God that brought the word of God with the power of God. Will is not preaching something he does not practice. He has a boldness that is very, very rare. He has a boldness that the Holy Spirit has brought to his life. It's, it's admirable. It's awesome and it's awful. It's awesome in the fact that it's enviable and it's awesome in the fact that we fall so short of that. He's not afraid to speak a good word for Christ. He's not afraid to speak to people. Lord, if all of us would do that, we could turn the world upside down for Christ. I pray that his message tonight would convict someone to grab some tracks and begin to faithfully present the gospel to people. If there be anybody here tonight that's not saved, they need to understand it would have been foolish for that city not to come and get that food. It's so foolish not to come and receive the bread of life, the Lord Jesus. Smite that heart, God, with tremendous conviction. Let them know your love. I pray for Brother Will that you'd protect and keep him as he travels. God, keep him from evil out there. Keep him close to you, hedge him. God, use him in a mighty way. And when he comes back at the end of the summer and gives us a report, I pray, God, that you will just do more than we can ask or think. Help us to give a little bit tonight. Even now, stir the people while they're standing, Lord. They got a few dollars in their pocket. We could all put some money in there and be a blessing to him. And that he could just know that his church loves him in a great and deep way. Bless us as we sing and go home now. In Jesus' name.
Amen. I am thine, O Lord. I have heard thy call. Page number 552. God bless you. I am thine, O Lord. I have heard thy voice and it all thy love to me. 